é, nada melhor do que um convidado da, da altura de Yuri Maltsev, que tem toda uma história muito interessante para nos contar a partir da sua experiência na Rússia, é, com todo o movimento da perestroika, e como ele atuou e colaborou, e como ele se desertou daquele, daquele regime. E, em seguida, vocês já podem ir formulando também as questões, é, podem escrevê-las no, no caderninho, as, as moças passam, e aí nós teremos, é, como de praxe, os últimos minutos da palestra para que vocês tirem as dúvidas que forem repassadas para nós anteriormente. ok? Bom, o Yuri, então, ele é pesquisador do Mises Institute e professor de economia no Carter de College. Ele trabalhou na equipe da reforma econômica de Mikhail Gorbachev antes de ter deserdado para os Estados Unidos em 1989. É autor e coautor de 15 livros, bem como recebedor do Luminary Award of the Free Market Foundation. Então, eu chamo para que nós comecemos a nossa tarde de hoje, Yuri Maltsev. Thank you for a very nice eulogy. And, uh, yes, this is Agva, no, now vodka. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, that's the only thing I know in Portuguese. Um, so, um, can you hear my translation or? Yeah? Perfect. So I really have a quite bizarre background. I worked for the Soviet government. Well, working for government is an oxymoron. Not many, <laughs> that's the kind of uh, false activity. And then I unexpectedly for myself defected to the United States to find myself working for the second largest bureaucracy of this planet for the United States government in Washington, D.C was working for a congressional think tank, United States Institute of Peace, which our old congressional think tank didn't think at all. We were just tanking. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I decided to do something positive with myself, and I'm teaching young Americans in Wisconsin, I'm teaching them ideas of von Mises, ideas of Hayek, ideas of liberty, supply and demand, amazingly enough, instead of teaching them social justice and Marxist economics like my colleagues do. Then, uh, <laughs> All right, so today we will talk about lessons of history that did not teach us anything. You know that the great American demographer, Rudolf Rommel from University of Hawaii, he calculated the human toss of socialism human toll of socialism for 200 million people which were murdered for nothing in the so-called socialist countries, socialist countries. And this lesson did not teach us anything. So what are the foundations of free society? Um, John Locke, who's a great British philosopher of the 17th century, he came up with the idea of self-ownership, self that who owns you? This is the most important issue. Who owns you? Do you own yourself? And if you cannot own yourself, then you're a slave. And John Locke believed that you have property in yourself and property in your labor, in your labor. And what is, what is socialism? Socialism is denying self-ownership. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to the state. And the state is an abstraction. The state belongs to a group of people. And so that means that people today, people say, in Cuba, are being owned by Raul Fidel and his clique. People in Venezuela by Maduro and his clique. People in North Korea by the Kim family. And so, Ludwig von Mises, he made a very good point that we cannot compare socialism and capitalism. That the most important is that choice between capitalism and socialism, it's not the choice between alternatives. It's a choice between life and death. It's a choice of, be, of living like a man 
or being a slave, or being a slave. And a slave, as bad as private slavery is, the, the socialist slavery or state slavery is even worse because under private slavery, uh, it, would be, it would be completely irrational for a slave owner to kill his slaves. Under public slavery, everybody is expendable because people are not only assets but also liabilities. And that's why in all types of socialist societies, mass murder was practiced Another, another source or another reason for mass murder was that socialism does not have any incentives whatsoever to do anything. So to make slaves do what the slave masters want them to do, you need to apply violence, you need to apply coercion, you need to threaten them. So instead of positive incentives, instead of working for something, you are working only because the gun is pointed at you. So this was the end of all socialist countries. 35 countries in the history of the 20th century practiced this deadly system. And this deadly system led again to 200 million people murdered. In the country I came from, from Soviet Union, we have different numbers. 43 million people murdered according to KGB and 61 million according to the same Rudolf Rummel or, or Solzhenitsyn Foundation. I don't care to tell the truth whether it's 43 or 61 million, because both numbers are above my head. Both numbers are so evil, and Stalin himself knew that. He used to say, death of one is a tragedy. Death of a million, just statistic. So Marx was the one who founded the system of mass murder, the system of mass murder. The, if the theory of communism should be summed um, in, one, in, in, in one sentence, then it's abolition of private property. Abolition of private property means abolition of property of yourself as well. So this is the, the, the democracy we had. Can you imagine, in the United States, we were on the brink already of socialism during last elections. One of the candidates, Bernie Sanders, was a proud socialist, proud socialist. He called himself democratic socialist. Well, he was democratic socialist in the, sense, in the same sense as North Korea is People's Democratic Republic of Korea. A lot of democracy right there. Then, uh, by the way, uh, if anyone, uh, the, the last slide will be my email. So if you would like to have this presentation, I can, I can email you if you email me. Uh, also, befriend me on Facebook if you use Facebook. We have very lively discussion, discussions of that. Marx was also a rabid anti-Semite. It's many people don't realize that, that Hitler, his anti-Semitism in a great length was founded in Marx's teaching. Hitler in Mein Kampf, he is writing that Marx was one of his great teachers, great teachers. I don't want to quote even this, you can read it yourself, uh, but that's what um, he, was, he was writing quite a lot, quite a lot. Uh, this is a different thing. I never use the word communist uh, I use the word socialism because communism was never practiced. Uh, many people would think, for example, in American academia, people would say, well, socialism is good, communism is bad, fascism is bad, but socialism is very good. The ideal of socialism is very attractive to us. However, communism was never practiced. Communism, according to Karl Marx, According to Karl Marx, um, communism was, was something which will come in 500 years. That will be a society where the state would wither away. There will be no state, no money. 
that people would work as hard as they possibly can and consume as little as they possibly can. They would go to these huge warehouses with public goods and you take whatever you need, but not an ounce more, not a gram more. You will be just this wonderful person and you will work as hard as you wish. And so that would be this communist society. And when Engels asked him when does he think it will come, he said maybe four or 500 years from now. So there is no communism. Communism was a carrot. Communism was a slogan, just a slogan. So <clears throat> then um, on Mises, he was writing about two patterns of socialism, two patterns of socialism. In his great human action, he <clears throat> described that there are two. One is Russian pattern. Russian pattern is purely bureaucratic. Everything is owned by the state. The whole society is managed like a huge post office managed by a postmaster general on the top. So it was a, a, the Marx formulated, oh, sorry, Mises formulated the theory of command economy way before Adolf Berle or anyone else among the so-called Sovietologists in the United States. This, uh, <coughs> um, uh, this is the Soviet command economy. In Soviet Union, Everybody worked for the state. Even shoe shine stand would be run by the state employee, by the so-called civil servant. Uh, then there is a German pattern. German pattern of socialism is when you have private property declared, but the private property is not guaranteed. You have a title for private property which is fake because it will be the government who will tell you when you should open, when you should close, whom you should hire, whom you should fire, what prices to charge, what prices to pay. So that will be central planning, central planning combined, combined with this nominal property rights. Most of so-called Western democracies right now are moving in that very direction, in that very direction because of this last elections when we made almost near escape from socialism. I was already thinking where to defect again. So you can see that national socialism and Soviet socialism, they even look alike. They're both forms of socialism. There is a wonderful video made in former Soviet Republic of Latvia called The Soviet Story. The Soviet Story. Uh, you can, I think, watch it for free on the World Wide Web. And this is worth of watching. It's, a, it's I think, a, a, great, a great warning what people, how people die if they, if they give up liberty. Then in Soviet Union, Lenin. He was considered to be by, I worked with Mr. Gorbachev, and um, he was considered by Gorbachev as a, as a founder of socialism, that he was not bad, Stalin was bad, but Lenin was good. No, turned out Lenin was a mass murderer number one, mass murderer number one. Then um, Leo Trotsky, another accomplice in, in mass murder, in mass murder. He was murdered by Stalin in 1940. Um, Trotsky, in 1925, he had a great idea that everybody should wear a uniform in the Soviet Union. That everybody should, that the whole society should be militarized. Militarized, and you order workers, soldiers, so-called, soldiers of socialist economy to do what is needed to do. Then we had Grigory Zinoev, another monster. Another, he was the, the chairman of Comintern, chairman of Comintern. Then he became the Prime Minister of Soviet Union. Uh, the, uh, he succeeded Lenin as being a chairman of the People's Commissars. And you can see what he was openly saying that even at that time, that we cannot carry the whole 100 million people into socialism. We should get rid of 10 million. One tenth of people should die. And we don't have anything to tell them. <laughs> And the mega murderer definitely was Comrade Stalin, Comrade Stalin, over 40 million victims, over 40 million victims. He used to say, every problem has a person lurking behind, lurking behind the problem. No man, no problem. 
Sorry, the guys are here. <laughs> Looks like. <laughs> So this is the, the story, this, we don't have much time to, but this is the story of how people were murdered, how, what kind of atrocities uh, were committed by, by the so-called socialist humanists. It's just amazing how many people, and how they were killed, especially religious people. Estimated 900,000 priests, monks, nuns were murdered under socialists murdered out. Why, this, why such a hatred towards religion? Well, Marx formulated religion is opium for the people. Religion is opium for the people. So the, the problem with that, and Stalin understood it very well, that if you believe in any religion, if you, if you are a Christian or Muslim or, or, or Jewish, then uh, you have a God in your head. And so there is a, the, this space is already taken. You cannot put Stalin there. You cannot put Marx there. You cannot believe in Marxism, which is secular religion, which is secular religion. And so they were murdering. I'm working at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., on archives of Soviet General Volkogonov. Volkogonov was a propaganda person in Soviet Union. Anytime he is on TV, I would switch him right away. Couldn't, couldn't stand him, and because he was both stupid and evil. And, and I never would imagine that the same very person, in 1980, went to Austria, bought for his Institute of Military History, he bought a Xerox machine, and was making highly illegal copies of everything going through his desk. If they would find it out, he would be murdered right away, without any trial. And so when the Soviet Union fell apart, he approached the U.S. ambassador in Moscow saying that I want to move this all to the United States, this archive, 46 big boxes. And our ambassador, he said, okay, I will put you in contact with the agency, that means CIA. And uh, he said, no CIA, Library of Congress, if CIA wants to read this, let them go to the library, get a reader's card, and read it there. I don't know if CIA did that, but I did. And I'm working on this archive almost by myself. No other readers, no, nobody takes it out. And this is fascinating archive. For example, about religion. There is a letter from a commissar from South Russia to Lenin. And it said, Dear Comrade Lenin, you told us to fight religion, but you didn't explain how. Lenin is writing him back. Dear comrade imbecile, <laughs> kill religious people, that's how. And then postscript, and kill them the way that everybody will tremble with horror 150 miles around. So that's what they were doing. If you, they're serving communion with liquid lead. They were skinning them. They were taking scalps. It was just the most unbelievable evil what they did to religious people, to religious people. Stalin in 1929, he even, he even decriminalized murder of priests. So Soviet government would not do anything to a person who would go and kill a priest and, and rape his wife and take whatever they have. Uh, so if the, the Chica, the, the secret police, will just say thank you so much for cleaning our world from social vermin. So who said that? My students would say Bernie Sanders, of course. <laughs> but that's another Bernie Sanders. Russians and technology do not work together. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so that's Hitler. Hitler admitted that, I mean, he was proud socialist and saying that socialism is our future. However, socialism only for Aryan people, for Nordic people, not for Slavs, not for Jews, not for gypsies. So that would be, that would be social vermin as well. So what fascism is again, another form of collectivism. And von Mises and Hayek analyzed it in great detail, in the great detail. Maybe I should point somewhere else. 
Yes. So, <laughs> so the whole idea, it doesn't matter who owns the business if they're working for us. If they're working for us. Amazingly now that present president of Russia, Mr. Putin, he, I think, succeeded in building fascist economy. And he that just said the same thing, that I don't, I, I, I'm not worried who owns the plants and factories. What I worried if they work for us, that means for the big state, for the big state. So socialism is war, and war is socialism. Think that if we have more socialist countries, we would have Third World War already a long time ago, long time ago. So the last... <laughs> <laughs> the last uh, uh, crime of communists, the last crime of socialists was uh, Chernobyl, was Chernobyl. Chernobyl was amazing for me because at that time when Chernobyl happened, Mr. Gorbachev, he said that he was deceived, that he was told about this catastrophe only a week after, a week after it happened. And so he declared policy of glasnost. Glasnost was a collateral to perestroika. Perestroika means restructuring. Glasnost means openness. It's not freedom of speech, just more open, more transparency in government. In government. And amazingly enough, quite recently in this Volkogon of archives, it turned out that he knew what happened in Chernobyl 10 minutes after it happened. And at three, this catastrophe happened at 1.24 a.m. And at three o'clock, they already had a Politburo meeting chaired by Mr. Gorbachev. So Mr. Gorbachev turned out to be one of them rather than one of us, as many people think. Mr. Gorbachev, however, he was instrumental in destroying Soviet Union because he removed the fear out of the system which was glued together only by fear. And so when the fear was gone, then everybody stopped working. We had a joke at that time that the CIA and American government didn't know what's happening in Moscow. What is perestroika? And they find, found out that James Bond is retired and living in London. So they hired James Bond and sent him to Moscow to find out what is happening with perestroika. And James is walking from one store to another with a little notebook. He goes to a butcher shop and writing there, no meat, going to a bakery, writing there, no bread, going to a shoe store, no shoes. And there is a KGB officer looking over his shoulder and he said, a year ago, you would be shot for doing that. He writes there, no bullets. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> when the people decided that no bullets, then everybody stopped working. I remember my, my secretary, who, who never worked, I would say, in her life, but she was packing paper clips into her purse, putting paper clips into her purse. And I said, Lena, why you are stealing state property in such a strange form, paper clips? And she said, Yuri, what else can I take from this F office? <laughs> Show me. I'll take that. Nothing. Nothing here. She was so frustrated. I even pointed at the Lenin's picture. I said, how about Lenin's picture? She said, only if I'll open a shooting range. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and I thought, I thought that at that time already, people are not right. That Mr. Gorbachev made it, made it happen, made it happen. So we will go. I see that <clears throat> uh, somebody it stopped it. Yeah, that explains why Russian eagle is double-headed. Also, <laughs> this is all I, because I have a time warning. So. We will go pretty fast through this. This is where Chernobyl is and what is happening there. That's amazing that they blew, they blew it up because they checking, checking. Uh, this is what it is. This is Mr. Gorbachev. 
Mr. Gorbachev was pretty funny. I remember he was, for example, saying, there is no problem with central planning. Central planning is great. The problem is that we never had a good plan. <laughs> and you really think, and my boss even would say, Yuri, do you think there is something behind that birthmark? You remember he had this birthmark. Is there something behind it? I would say it was empty space. <laughs> and this is all Chernobyl. Yes, and so uh, the, the proof, I think, rests with the Austrian school. The, uh, Ludwig von Mises, in his uh, essay the, um, about economic calculation and the socialist commonwealth, he predicted that this society is doomed because they cannot calculate anything. Hayek said the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. Hayek is my favorite. That's the wrong Hayek. <laughs> this Hayek. So this... And... This Hayek and von Mises, uh, definitely I think that I am very thankful to von Mises because he not only gave us Hayek, he gave us everything. He gave us a wonderful Austrian school of economics. And we should, I think I would agree with Alan Ebenstein, that while it's possible to imagine Mises without Hayek, it's not possible to imagine Hayek without Mises as well as Rothbard without Mises as well as today's Austrian economists all around the world. Well, I think maybe I already depressed you enough. So, so what if I will take questions, if we have any questions? Bom, é, muito obrigada, Yuri, pela incrível palestra. É, nós vamos fazer as questões, vocês podem fazê-las é, em português, a, elas, elas podem trazê-las para mim? E eu, a tradutora vai fazer em simultâneo. E se vocês quiserem, ao longo da, das respostas, ele enviarem mais perguntas, nós ainda temos alguns minutos para tentarmos darmos, é, dar conta delas, ok? Primeira questão. Yuri, uma vez que socialistas não respeitam direitos de propriedade, isso não dá direito a outras pessoas, mesmo libertários, de não respeitarem direitos de propriedade de indivíduos socialistas? Well, I think property rights of socialist individuals is an oxymoron. Socialist individuals do not have property rights. It's just by definition, yeah. You can't, you can't sit on two chairs at the same time. Yeah, you're either there or here. So you're either in Gulag or out of Gulag. <laughs> this is very interesting that it's written. There's one thing which I don't know that I, I think that not many people know about that. Then Khrushchev, Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, you remember, was an idiotic, plump dictator in the Soviet Union. And, um, and he, in 1956, he denounced Stalin on the 20th Congress of the Communist Party. And somebody sent him a question like this, saying, where were you when these crimes were committed? You were Stalin's, Stalin's crony. And he said, who wrote this question? Please stand up. And nobody would stand up. <laughs> and he said, I was exactly there where you are. <laughs> Was very so even they were afraid. Thanks. É, a próxima pergunta para o Yuri é foi quando que ele se deu na verdade quando que ele ach, é, como é que eu iria expressar isso quando que ele é, conseguiu efetuar uma mudança para o livre mercado quando que ele teve contato com as obras de Mises, Hayek pela primeira vez como foi o impacto desse encontro e se a partir dali ele realmente se tornou adepto do livre mercado e quando e como foi isso? Amazing that uh, I was uh, was on Glenn Beck show describing this very issue. I don't watch TV. I don't want my life expectancy to drop. And so I didn't know who is Glenn Beck, but I was got a call and and um, his assistant said. 
uh, would you like to be on our program, but you must come with your own topic. And I said, how about Road to Serfdom? That's the book that changed my life. And so I was on the road to serfdom on his, together with Tom Woods, maybe you know Tom Woods. Yeah. And, uh, and um, uh, Glenn Beck was waving this book, Road to Serfdom, say, America, read this book. Next morning, I got a phone call from University of Chicago Press, which has the royalties on this. They got 500,000 orders for this book. Since then, I believe in, believe in, in, in television. And I'm proud that I kind of stirred the interest. But how it happened, when I was a four-year student in Moscow State University, a friend of mine gave me road to serve them, which was blind typed, something called Sum is Dot, underground publishing. And I spent one night with that. At that time, for reading Hayek, or for reading Orwell, or Solzhenitsyn, you get seven years of prison in Soviet Union. The only good news would be that nobody would survive seven, they would die in three or four. <laughs> and if you pass it around, it will be 15 years already. And, and I was, I wouldn't say I was a socialist because my grandfather was murdered by Stalin and my father's life was screwed up because of this. But from another hand, reading Hayek was like developing a film things that I was thinking he put in a crystal clear sentences. So that was next morning, I returned back the book and I went to the dean's office and I, and I be became, took a, another major, economic history and history of economic thought. And then I received a letter to Lenin's library that I can read capitalist poison. I, that, that, and so, and so there was a, there was a special safe, safekeeping department that with this letter that you are admitted to criticize bourgeois, vulgar political economy, you could go there and read this poison, but you, you sign a letter that, that you never will tell anybody about it. <laughs> what did you read? And there I began to read a lot of Hayek at first, a lot of Hayek, and then I found von Mises, I found Mary Rothbard, and I was blessed that when I defected to the United States, I'm, I spent a lot of time with Murray, with Murray Rothbard, with Hans Hoppe, Tom Di Lorenzo, and other great people of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. And I have it, I think here I have a, a kind of a, a the, uh, well, I don't know what it is, but uh, that's the card of uh, Ludwig von Mises Institute of Sweden which I, I, I was there last year. Then we have, I, last uh, January, this January, I was speaking at Von Mises Institute in South Africa and Free Market Foundation. They have Von Mises Institute in Estonia. So this is great. This is great that this movement is growing so fast. Uh, a lot of my students know about Austrian economics even before they would come to my classes. Nosso tempo já esgotou e seria ótimo ficar muito mais tempo com o Yuri e com essa sabedoria, não só intelectual, mas, sobretudo, sabedoria de vida, que eu acredito que é o que mais encanta em pessoas que passaram e sofreram pelo regime fascista, nazista, tiveram familiares mortos. E essa experiência que o Yuri viveu ela é marcante para todos nós, porque ela simboliza uma sabedoria de vida que hoje nós perdemos. Os adolescentes, hoje em dia, eles são criados com um iPhone na mão e não têm ideia do que é um regime fascista, nazista, e aí eles não sabem os princípios, né? eles não conseguem conceber os princípios e por que essas organizações criminosas se fizeram possíveis. Então, o Yuri vai ficar conosco hoje, vai ficar conosco amanhã também, e as perguntas eventuais que vocês tiverem, vocês podem é, deixar conosco, que ao longo da, desses dois dias nós passaremos para ele. Thank you very much for your amazing words. It was a pleasure for us. I also yeah. hope to see you on Facebook, yes. on email. Yeah. Let's stay connected. <laughs> yes. yeah. Thank you.